Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the Society of the Spectacle by Guy Debord. Did anybody want to start off with like maybe kind of a quick summary? Well, I really wanted to ask Fran. Uh, Fran, this was one of your uh, like pivotal books, right? Uh, I, I, it really was. It, it like reading this book sort of. I don't know, was an important moment for me in, they assigned the only the first chapter in grad school in a class I was in about the history of um, craft and design. And I don't know if it was a disservice to my like uh, artistic work, because once I did it, I could no longer even like fathom being in a gallery. And once I read this, I couldn't fathom being in a gallery anymore. It's like, what's the point of showing your art comes the question in that context, right? I guess. Well, money. <laughs> which is yeah problematic, right? So. Um, well, you know, everything's commodified. You gotta, you gotta accept it, right? Yeah. How, how dare you want your art to be uh, some pure, uncapitalist thing? Right. And then, and then I, 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 sorry, I don't want to do. I want to make sure that we get to Mike's question about summarizing it. I don't know if I'm the most um, like uh, the right person to summarize the book. I can summarize that first chapter for you real well, but I was, I'll, I'll I, give my summary, not of the exact sequence of the book, but what I think the book is generally yeah and that is a modern update of capital by marx essentially marx in especially uh you know the first chapter of capital where he or really where he starts out um his analysis of political economy is with the production of commodity essentially capitalism is the production of commodity um or that system which visually um and like tactically is that which produces commodity and the board says well Essentially, the, the spectacle is the commodity now. We don't really produce things, we produce spectacles. Yeah. And so uh, then he kind of follows along Marx, and you know, because Marx then traced through how this new organization of society built around the production of commodities leads to certain human relationships, or, or how the production of commodities creates the relationships between the people that produce them. And so De Board is essentially saying, how do we relate to ourselves or, or each other or not relate to ourselves and each other um, in the modern capitalist society where we no longer um, are focused on like the production of things, but rather, I guess, spectacle, but- again, And there's, there's also kind of this, to, there's also the kind of this deep running theme of like alienation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, that's the, that's the Marxist, essentially in, in capitalism because of the structure of the production of commodity around there being the ones who want to turn money into more money through commodities and those who want to acquire money to purchase commodity uh, interact. You know, the MCM and CMC, you know, sides of capitalism, you know, essentially financers and consumers or um, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. Can you repeat that? People who want to, the, the piece about money, what was? Okay, yeah, so essentially, because, you know, uh, Marx essentially talks in, in Capital about how there's two general sides to Capital. There's, mm -hmm. you know, people who work for money so that they can use the money to buy things, you know, buy the sustenance of life, whatever. Sure. And then there's the other side, which is those who essentially, the capitalists or the bourgeois, which are those who have money and deploy money in such a way as to earn more money, to earn profit. Right. And they organize those who want the commodity. And this leads to a certain general structure where people relate to each other through their relation to the capitalist. Because they work individually for the capitalist, um, they're essentially, even though they're working together, it's they're divided uh, amongst Got each it. other, you know? And so they're dis and then alienation is alienation from others in the production of it, alienation from like what you're producing and how, and then, um, I guess, a yeah, alienation from your own, like natural life in the production. Of. And, and where do you see that in the board? Do you see these two sides reinterpreted in the board? Is it, or did I misunderstand? Was that not what you were getting at? Yeah, no. Well, I mean, I'm saying, I'm just trying to explain for those who, uh, are listening in or, or for Mike who, yeah, Eddie, I think who I guess, haven't read capital. Right. I, I guess for me is like, read it, so. yeah, I feel like, and I, again, I haven't read capital. So, um, but I feel like this is more of a psychological take than I've heard Capital has. Sure. Like I don't think Marx really Cap focuses oh, on is the is the pamphlet, right? It's the it's like the it's not a long one, right? No, that's the I think that's Communist oh, no. Manifesto. Capital is like thou a thousand pages. I think just yeah, for volume Capital's one. Capital's huge. Like chapter uh, right. one, honestly, just chapter one of Capital, where he essentially talks about the commodity, is, is seriously worth reading. Yeah. Just to understand the kind of 
foundation of at least Marxist economics. Right. Okay. And um, to think about so, so, but essentially, let's go back to the board. So the the fundamental issue with capital is it, you essentially have to pr- or you have to in, to produce more and more profit. You need to come up with more and more commodities. You need more and more people to consume the commodities that are, you know, this is the kind of logic of the system. But the problem is there's only so much material. There's, there's only so much um, like stuff that people actually need. And so in a certain sense, the commodity is or was a restriction on capital, you know, on its ability to grow and create more profit. So essentially, I'm not sure about when, I think around the beginning of the 20th century, uh, you know, capitalism kind of made a shift towards um, consumerism, you know, in, in this advocation of like people need to be consumers. You know, we need to essentially cultivate people such that they want to or need to uh, buy more and more commodity, you know, to right. keep the kind of cycle going. But then the question is, well, what do we produce when we, or like, how do we produce imaginary? Essentially, like, we, the logic requires us to go into the imaginary, to go, or at least uh, to go into the imagination for our source of uh, commodities, I guess. You know, we have right. to commodify what's not material uh, such that capitalism can continue to grow without limit or at least transcend that limit. Okay. And I feel like DeBoard picks it up right there, right? He's in the, he is, what is it, in the, is it the 50s or early 60s? Um, I think this is like 67, right before the, the riots, like the next year, which were largely, I think, like part of the same, the movement, like kind of the situationist movement. Right, right. Um, He's picking it up right there. Right. Or what, what do you have to add, Michael? Sorry. Oh, no. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, that's good to put it in that kind of context. Um, and then I guess he revisited it later. I mean, it feels like I mean, it feels like it could as well have been written today. I mean, like, I um, agree. <laughs> it's 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 timeless at this point. Um, I think although, especially, yeah, well, you know, I, I think in the age of Instagram and interest and whatever you have going on on your sort of like social you know, media, social media, but especially the image, like the ones that are yeah. literal image centered. Yeah. Um, mm. It's just such a it's such a pure manifestation of what the board is saying that I'm like, is this is this a joke that like uh, social media apps are playing on us? Like they're literally having us like, you know, set up our couch in such a way that we look nice and then we do our hair and we sit in and take a picture of it and then never leave our house. Like um, it's bizarre. Um, yeah. That how, how relevant it feels to that type of um, very normalized cultural behavior. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting model, but I almost kind of feel like maybe trying to criticize it for a minute. Um, yeah, go. Because like I think it would be kind of interesting to look at his methodology. Um, like, does he make logical arguments and all that? No. I I guess one like thing that just is, and this might be like I don't know a categorical error on my part, but like he creates a system that you can't really criticize. Like he kind of basically says like if you deny this whole model, that's that's like the bourgeoisie thing to do. Like, mm-hmm. you know, to basically deny, I think he had something about at the start of chapter two about one becoming two and two becoming one. And like one, right. one is how the proletariat thinks, the other is how the bourgeois think. And if you just don't th- think this is like a thing, that's like a bourgeois thing. Um, but I might've had that backwards. Um, I, anyway. Yeah, I missed that. Oh, go ahead, Nathan. No, 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 you, Eddie. I don't know. I, I see that argument a lot whenever I'm reading like just, just general like leftist versus capitalist kind of stuff where whenever somebody's defending capitalism, like argument is oh like they got you they've gotten to you they've deceived you you're like a um you're a part of the proletariat but they've like tricked you and it, it seems like unfalsifiable i i feel like it's technically valid the way that like when people say communism like doesn't work because it's never been tried correctly could technically be correct and like we don't really sure. like to we don't really like to hear that kind of reasoning i don't know it, it could just be like a weird smell well, it's like a purest it's such a purest take on anything right like technically anything that is well thought through if done correctly, would work. But the problem is, is things aren't generally, you know, what we need is a fail-proof plan for uh, for norm, for like actual living people who frequently don't do things by the book, right? Yep. Can I just insert here that there is no there is no real um, blueprint for uh, communism. You know, Marx never said, in a, certain, in a certain sense, Marx saying, here's the problems with capitalism, not here is the solution to these problems. Yeah. Because so, that would be a fool's errand. And it, I mean, I think, it, I mean, this might be too reductive, but it feels like a lot of the problems are psychological, like problems just in the way that we think. Um, and that's not mm-hmm. something that, like, we can necessarily change. Well, but isn't kind of DeBoard's point that capitalism and us through it have changed it? We have changed the way we think, you know? 
um, we have, like, I, I think it would be very difficult for our ancestors to understand. I mean, it, it feels us. to him that, like, capitalism was, like, put upon us, in his view. That it's not, like, just sort of a natural extension of the way that we think as humans. It did feel kind of, like, well, it's external. Not. But see, that's the thing, Mike. Or that's, I think, um, fundamentally, I, kind of capitalism was imposed. I mean, I'm not sure if you know of, like, the encapture movement. Or is it the enclosure? I think enclosure movement in, like, in but essentially, you know, to, to get capitalism going in England or industrial capital, say, you know, they essentially had to kick uh, peasants off the land and force them into a state where they needed to huh. uh, work for money. Like yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not process. saying, right, and I'm, I'm certainly not saying that capitalism is like the natural state of being. I just feel like there is a psychological component to it. And um, oh, definitely. To me, that's kind of like potentially where it where it comes from more than um like material factors but i mean it's like a lot you know i think he, he makes a point later too that like ideology is material so i mean those two are not necessarily opposites right and so i'm pretty sure at some point he talks about like nomadic cultures does he or did i am i thinking of something else yeah. but he i think he does talk about this sort of like humans in their innate state versus the sort of rapidly degradating state of humans today who now like are obsessed with the spectacle thing that never existed before. I'm pretty sure that's a that's a core point of the book. I, I agree with that take on it. Um, I think I think that that yeah. To to come back to like the trajectory of this book, I'm so tuned into like what's going on at the beginning, and then I get lost as it goes through. And I'm curious if either of you are speaking to some of the things later on in the book, where it sounds like he's talking about um, in these chapters that are titled like ideology materialize and negation and consumption within culture right like that feels like he might be coming to some sort of point that i missed and i wonder if, if he goes pretty hard into this thing about time around chapter five that um i'll try to summarize all i'm gonna really butcher it it's that like we used for. we used to kind of have this idea as time as being like this eternal thing or sorry um cyclical, uh, cyclical that's right because we sort of had this this cycle that matched oh, our labor yeah. right we'd like work during the day and sleep at night um but then we kind of got sold this idea of time being like a chronology and in that way sort of the dominant forces were able to capture the telling of the chronology so that you know we would be dependent on them for information um mm -hmm. and then what we now have is sort of this like pseudo cyclical time um and that's sort of like this you know disguised historical thinking um or sorry historical time because historical thinking i think is something else historical thinking is like a belief in like marx's principle of historical materialism um that said I didn't really get the time stuff all that well. It didn't feel like super intuitive to me. Um, I think like really kind of the most interesting stuff to me happened in, in the first half. I don't know, Nathan, okay. did you did you kind of take anything else away from that? Um, crap. Yeah, so essentially the, the main thing is pretty much in alienation. You know, it's uh, that we've been alienated from our like say natural state or whatever. Um, I guess I don't, for me, that wasn't incredibly interesting. Um, maybe because I still am not really there um myself or not really outside the like capitalist mode let's say myself you know um sure. I think. but I, I don't know about you too but like after reading the first couple of chapters it's like everything in this book i read through this lens of the spectacle so now i you know we're on this chapter about time and we're talking about pseudo time and i don't even know if this, this is actually what he's saying but what i pull out of it is that our perception of time is a sort of spectacle right i, I feel like i had this really good moment in the while reading about these these you know pseudo time that like we don't even really like see time for what it is anymore we see it as this uh sort of thing that needs to be stamped in a certain way in order for us to feel like we accomplished something i don't know if he says that outright but like in the context of the first half of this book yeah i feel like the board doesn't paint the, oh, oh sorry i just said that those are the dots that i connected but. yeah i mean i feel like the board doesn't really paint a very clear picture of what man outside the spectacle looks like or should be or anything like that so i don't know it wasn't totally clear to me where man you know free man ended and the spectacle which is kind of maybe i don't know i was going to talk i guess also i feel like a little um sort of the historic there's like this historical method of like analysis i guess that like daniel quinn does in ishmael where you look at like prehistoric man like basically and nietzsche does it too where you look at like how <laughs> and i think prehistoric right and i think we talked about this when we were talking about nietzsche it's like you're kind of seeing whatever you want to see in prehistory so i think that's like yeah. a, a fallible method um sure. well then good on the board for not for not going down that the other <laughs> that, the, the other thing that i kind of struggle with interesting though 
the other thing that I kind of struggle with too is like, okay, so the spectacle has pervaded everything. It's everywhere. It controls like the way we perceive things. Like we just look at images now um, and we've been awash in this since we were born. How can we even mm -hmm. conceive of the idea of the spectacle? Like what if, if, if the spectacle has like a monopoly on ideology, like it controls what ideas are allowed. Can you even formulate a valid challenge to the system from within it? Like I, I, I feel like that's just not something that I don't know what it, that that point would have to happen for like revolution. Like it feels like it's very. I, I would disagree. I think that I think that this there's no spectacle most of the time. Like if you slip and fall on ice, for example, that those moments of free fall and then you hit the ground and you're dead. right. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like it's experience, spectacle. right? Yeah. yeah, we have those moments. You know, every day we take we make we take a poop, right? Like that moment of like feet leaving your body. There's no spectacle there. Like that's real <laughs> life, and you're experiencing it. So I do think we have lots of reference points. I think, especially, you know, I can imagine in childbirth, for example, like there's yeah. no spectacle. I mean, people try, you know, you get these funny pictures or videos on social media of people in the birthing room, but. Yeah, it hasn't really been captured. Is it, is yeah. it, is it just <laughs> uncapturable? Is it too, too raw? Probably, yeah. Is it like garlic for the spectacle? We just have to find stuff like that? Actually, the, the prevalence of the cesarean section is probably, you know, the, the surg surgical removal of a baby is probably our, our you know, quest towards removing any real experience <laughs> I, you know not, i've never had to do either one so i don't know <laughs> um yeah that makes sense because i feel like he talks at one point sort of about us having moved from like um being to ha having to appearing or sorry having into being into appearing and then like mm. the i guess a, a good step forward could be and like, pursuing feeling um sorry that might have been too but um well i, I thought you recall him saying be like having to being perceiving i remember that trajectory yeah what, what was that vision that you 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 had to that oh um that i don't know it would make sense to pursue feeling like experience what you're saying um because it is immune to spectacle or like yeah. as long as we're trapped in these fleshy bodies we're, we're gonna we're gonna have real experiences yeah um i guess one thing that like really interested me is sort of just how yeah i this is sort of like i guess a modern adaptation of marx with like a psycho a psychological lens that i think is really important um Sure. Do you guys feel like there's any like psychological difference between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie? Like, is there a difference in psychology, or is it um, the same? But like, I don't know. Does anybody have a, a take on that? Oh, I have a I have a take. I just want to say that I worry that to sound like uh like I'm better than certain people, but you know, I think we all probably have been in the that those shoes where you're like, how do people vote for Trump or something like that, right? Like, it feels like <laughs> that type of thing, but. It's kind of like, uh, the, the proletariat's psychological situation seems to be obsession, right? Like there's just, there's, there's always a carrot dangling in front of them and they're obsessed. They just can't think of, they can't see anything because they're just looking at that carrot all day long. And, you know, maybe that carrot gets swapped out here and there um, for something else. But I, I think, I think of that as the psychological state of the proletariat, right? It's, whereas, but it, whereas the power, that also, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just gonna, isn't that also the, the state of the capitalist now as well? Like, or aren't we all subsumed in the spectacle? Like, I thought that was a point he's trying to make is that there is right. no area outside. Certainly. I think, I think this comes back to the, the larger theme of alienation that is like, yes, we are all alienated and the spectacle is like the driving factor in that alienation, according to Dvorak, right? I'm going to say something that might be conceived as like problematic, but I think it's like kind of maybe a question worth asking is, um, it kind of, and maybe I'm not interpreting this correctly, but at one point he sort of makes it sound like racism is an invention of the spectacle. You know, it's sort of like another way of dividing the proletariat to keep them, you know, disorganized. Um, I don't know, yeah, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, that, I don't know if that's too spicy to touch, but like, is racism- I don't think it's spicy. I think, spicy about that at all. I think that a lot of folks who live and breathe like Black Lives Matter issues will tell you all day long that race is an invention created to divide, uh, you know, poor people. Um, Know, race is an invention to justify slavery for example mm -hmm. but um, i almost kind of feel I, like oh sorry no i think i think I, i'd prefer to hear you elaborate on that yeah yeah i mean it's possible that like race was an invention but i feel like racism is more of like the act of somebody committing some sort of like bad moral action and if you say that like race is it like if you say that like racism is an invention of the spectacle it almost sort of like absolves racists of like responsibility whereas um I think it's important to kind of still put some responsibility onto the individual instead of like blame everything on the spectacle, which well, my, I don't know, might be a really yeah. problematic way of thinking, but um, I, I don't know. I guess right, I just sort I of, just, yeah, yeah, please. 
Well, I just wanted to say that isn't one aspect, I mean, because essentially the spectacle as he kind of paints it is like society as spectacle is essentially the way in which we ourselves perform a role like within, it, right? Like the way that yeah. we kind of act, you know? And so it's not, I don't think it's so much in absolute, and it's just because, oh yes, there's a spectacle going on and like we're, or because capital is now spectacular um, and we're doing it uh, that way. I, I don't think that's necessarily absolution um, of responsibility, um, or I, I don't see it as absolving responsibility uh, to say that it is spectacle. I think it's rather, you have to see it as part of the spectacle to then take responsibility. Yeah. Like you, you need to see the way in which you yourself are performing and like for right. whom are you performing and like you know what role are you you playing out here yeah and at the um, at the end of the book word really does put an emphasis on practice like that you really can't have a critical theory without without putting it to practice um which uh really feels like a personal attack to me um <laughs> but he, so i so to my understanding of of what nathan's saying here is like the racism exists within the sort of like larger system that is, you know, culture at large, you know, this, the society of the spectacle. Racism exists within that closed system. So sure, it can be, I, I almost, yeah, it, it's not that it's absolved as much as it is like only true within its silly context that's been completely constructed, right? I mean, I wonder though how much of it is that the spectacle created the name of racism, but like what it was describing was always kind of there, that like we do treat people differently based on their appearance um, and worse. I guess, um, and yeah. the way that we sort of look at it now as, and we call it racism, and we have a particular way of, of, of framing it, um, or like, you know, explaining that part of our, that uncomfortable part of our psyche, like our cultural narrative about what we do. Um, I don't know, racism, I, but I don't know, I guess that's the only way I've ever known it. So it feels like it captures the message of what's behind it, but maybe it was I just like invented. How, I like how racism's led to a new industry of like uh, the, the, the cleansing industry or whatever so that like oh my god i'm racist i you know kind of like um deep not detox what what is that called the places you uh, go if you're an addict i think you're right detox rehab no rehab rehab yeah you know it's like you know whenever a famous person oh you you're know, saying like racism is, has been turned into like a psychological disease that you can cure oh well i mean to the degree it's acceptable it, it has to be curable you know or it has to be something that you can yeah. quote unquote do the work on yeah and that's to me and i'm only starting to think this way lately as a psychologist is that like that's not a very good way to always look at things as like there is a disease and there is a cure like that can be i don't oh, know almost well, kind of like but mike yeah mike you're thinking about like reality i'm talking about the market here like there's people making money you know like yeah. there's jobs being created right you gotta right. think from the capitalist like mode of production here we I, need to make profits we have to create new markets racism has become a marketable, um, like, or there's solutions. There's marketable solutions uh, to fix racism here. And, like, there's people, you know, uh, we're, we're straying a little bit from, if I may, we're, we're straying a little bit from the board, but I'm totally, like, this is a deep rabbit hole that I've gone down with Kara recently because I don't know about you all, but I've seen, like, this, a lot of this, like, buy black. Have you seen that, like, hashtag buy black? Like, no. I have. Like, my school, we're literally, at my workplace, we're circulating lists of locally owned or black owned local black -owned businesses. businesses. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm sitting here and like, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I like nod my head and I'm okay with it. Like I, I will participate with it at work, you know, I, especially because we buy so much shit at work. I hope that we're, I, I would love for it to, to go in any different direction than, than Amazon or whatever. Um, but at home, when it comes to like, who are we going to donate to and stuff like that? I'm like, you know, I think money is the poison. If, if we're actually going to talk about how are we going to solve this problem? Money has never solved a single problem. So I don't want to throw money at anything like, that. you know what I mean? Like I will, I like participating with those things outside of my house. But well, when it actually comes my, my, just my real decisions, my personal decisions, I don't, I really do you think that that exactly what you're saying, Nathan, it's like that's perpetuating the problem uh, by, by, by commercializing um, anti-racist culture is perpetuating the problem in a big way, I think. I think what we're doing what is we're I think what we're doing is we're conflating money with time and we're trying to use money in place of time. Like, oh, in a, but Mike, but we, yeah, Mike, that's the logic of capitalism. Right. That's essentially the, the focus on time is because the labor time or as Marx formulates it, labor time is the foundation of value right gotcha. okay and value i was going to say there's from people working there's a section in the board that oh yeah friend sorry 
No, I I really want to emphasize that I disagree that we're conflating money and time just because um, you know, I don't use the word poison lightly. I really do think money is this poison, largely because of what I've gathered from, I think, both Marx and Debord, which is like this alienation bit, the fact that the money separates us from from actually accomplishing anything, like any true experience, right? Like the money is this veneer on what should be, right? Right. So, so it's it's not a conflation of money and time as much as it is just like the money is the drug that gets you, that, that sort of sends you down the spiral of... Uh, I don't know, terrible things, all terrible things in the past 200 years, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the hard part with alternate histories, though, is, again, what's the alternative? You know, and to go back to Frederick Jameson, you know, it's harder to uh, imagine the, or it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capital. Mm. Like we, uh, because again, you know, like we can say, and I, I agree with you, there's just so many things that are wrong with the financial system, with our society, with the way that we use, you know, debt, and money to like ruin people's lives whereas other people are you know do nothing but for me it's not about that word Mm -hmm. of like a a labor market issue as much as it is about a like this this very spectacle oriented thing where the money like you know right now i'm I'm talking to you all while sitting on a couch it's hard Mm -hmm. for me to literally sit on a couch because i had to pay money for this so i'm not just sitting on a couch i'm sitting on 900 dollars. i think dare i say wow you're sitting on a 900 dollar couch I think, no, this is probably, I don't know how much it was, but. Um, Damn rich man over here. Whatever. <laughs> with me, with me. It's a comfy ass couch, right? That's part of the issue, right? Is because I can't, I can't just, you know, I think a lot of people never separate the two. You know, you, you they're always stuck sitting on the $900 instead of sitting on a couch. And that's oh, the yeah. poison. That's the moment of like, you've, you've, you've surrendered your life um, because you can't think anymore in anything other than dollars in dollar signs. Let me let me once just you, once you assign value and it's done. You're you're it's over, right? Let me try re-explaining alienation from like a psychological perspective. Is that we Please. we know we're what we shouldn't be doing what we're doing, but we do it anyway. And this causes guilt and Is that not part of dissonance? Yeah. Yeah my no. that's I don't think that's alienation. I think it's but it could be the same. Like I think it could have the same effect. And that's just sort of like this deadening force that we feel that keeps us subdued as opposed to being detached from our our work product like i agree that that is that that is weird but is that weird enough to be the source of like our neuroses our just our constant burden i think so i think it starts you down the rabbit hole or sorry the the downhill the slippery slope of of dissociating everything from everything right like i'm i'm in a permanent state of disassociation um you're saying trying to trying to take a psychological a purely psychological look at it i think so yeah like you know, we are at the end product of this this long history, more and more disassociation to the point where, yeah, like, yeah. Potentially. I mean, yeah. And it's like, I don't, I don't know. I guess if you move away from like the psychological disease model, it maybe frees you up to kind of play around with that a little bit more. Like you don't, I don't know. You don't have, don't really. Okay. So I feel like Deleuze and Guattari, I don't know if you guys know, the, they basically, from what I understand, I haven't read anti- Anti-Oedipus, but it so- sort of so- sounds like they advocate using this like schizoid approach to philosophy where you just sort of bounce around between ideas a lot and try to break through boundaries that like group ideas together that you would naturally stay within. And so that breaks you out of this tendency to stay within particular groups of ideologies. And so that is kind of a a tool. I don't know that they advocate it as like just a way of living, but like maybe as an abstract tool for like how to break outside of like certain modes of thinking. I'll just say that I'm, I'm, if we're, if we're ready to take that, another deep dive into like the criticism of society, the spectacle. I'm right there with you. I do think, I do think that it's worth um, allowing this to exist as one of those nodes that we bounce into, but then we, of course, we're all bouncing back to our real lives where we, where we operate, you know, use money on a regular basis. And I think, I think what comes to, I would love to bring up ad busters, right? Which you brought up earlier Mm. and just how that's such an obvious um, manifestation of like something that came after the board, I don't know. I don't know exactly where it came from. Somewhere in the '80s, right? They, they, there was this movement of like use the tools of the problem to this is to to dissemble the problem, right? Like to to or yeah, yeah. And that's that's Adbusters' ethos, right? Is like we're gonna use what we hate to sell what we prefer, right? Um, yeah, which, yeah. I mean, you, they're they're violating they, the very to call them hypocrites. so easy to call them hypocrites, but right. I don't know. <laughs> it's i mean it's just it's it's unavoidable like okay so let me give you this 
quick example. Um, I was talking to my mom who works with a publishing company. Um, she knew a guy who like was going to get a book published, but then they kind of backed out of it because it wasn't really like their message. And they're really starting to target more of like the identity politics kind of left leftist crowd. And this was kind of more of like a critical look at that. Um, and so they didn't, they didn't publish it because it wouldn't sell. Um, so you're basically getting this like narrowing of um, what's like, I guess, published or what's part of like public discourse as a result of market forces. And like, I think we were saying on, on Discord earlier, it's like, oh, I didn't hear about Gita Board's board game because, or sorry. Um, was no, that's exactly what I said, yeah. Yeah, we didn't hear about it because um, nobody wanted to publish a message that's like anti-commercial. So you just can't get that message through because I'd, like we we're saying, it's all, a lot of our information sharing is wrapped in, in money. Um, but no, but like the current capital, like the one of, uh, I remember this was one of the first things that got me actually paying attention to Zizek was, you know, he kind of brought up how Starbucks, you know, created that ingenious uh, form of advertising or this kind of, oh, you know, like one, uh, 10% or maybe it's only 1%, some like negligible amount goes to like poor Guatemalan children, you know, like it's essentially like within the price of the commodity is it's the, the absolution from guilt of right. consuming the commodity. It's like wrap them both in together. Like I see that the same with the like, <clears throat> Hey, we don't need to feel guilty about race, racism, or like our history of uh, oppression. Like, just buy from black-owned businesses. You know, like support, uh, you know, black small businesses. Like that, that'll just fix everything. You know, we don't need to address things at a at a more fundamental structural level. Yeah. You know, you can you can just wrap in the price. Just you know, pay a little more. You know, and you'll feel good about yourself too. Yeah, I mean, this um, is something I struggle with. I mean, it's like I'm not. I don't know. I feel like it's. Uh, it's a really touchy subject right now, but like, I mean, I feel like a lot of people on the far left would say that you're still improving the material conditions of the people that you're like donating or giving money to, even though it's still part of the problem. And that has like a, po a net positive effect. I don't know. I mean, it sort of comes down to like whether you think the spectacle can go away through like accelerating its issues, which I think is like what accelerationism is about. If you guys, I might be misinterpreting that. Basically, like really trying to like fuck it up, like just take it and oh, yeah. like, yeah. Um, so that we can that break idea. it. Which actually, ugh, dude, if you look at their message boards on Reddit, they're fucking awful people. Like, it is so racist and so, like, and I say that. What is? Fully aware of the irony of us, like, maybe not saying racism. I don't know. Um, Mike, what's so racist? Oh, so, you know, like, um, Mencius Moldbug and his, like, dark, dark enlightenment. Have you ever been on the subreddit there? No. Oh, it's horrible. You should check dude, it out. If you should check it out, it's but it's really like horrible. If it's MTG or... Um, FFXI, it's, I'm not, I'm not on it, you know, <laughs> I don't even go on the front page anymore. So I, I have not been on those subreddits myself either, but you know, I think, I think Michael's particularly familiar with like my own high school history being just deeply entrenched in troll culture. Yeah. Which sounds yeah. very rough. It sounds very adjacent to, to this. Right. And I will say the same thing about these, that type of mentality as I think of trolls today, right? Like, which is that like. If you you can you can say something like that and say it's like for the sake of like the hard reset, or huh. you can say something like that and say it's for the sake of the laws or whatever the lulls. The lulls, yeah. 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 But at the end of the day, it turns out you actually really believe that, and you're just kind of like using that. You know, like it turns out like what you the things you say and the things you do and the things you act. Maybe this is too much of like a pragmatist approach, but it's like but your actions are who you are, right? Like regardless yeah. of what you meant them in irony or in. Um, in, in, in as a sort of like means to an end of something else. So it sounds like well, no, it's a, it sounds like you, sincerity to irony. Yeah. yeah. What you choose to be ironic about is itself huh. some uh, some degree of sincerity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like you you adopt a philosophy that justifies what you want to do anyway. Um, right. Mm. And I think like right. even when looking at even when looking at society the spectacle like I feel like we have a tendency to want to argue against it because it pre presents an uncomfortable truth and like our reaction to you know, these, I don't know, our reaction to these, these uncomfortable thoughts is to try to, you know, explain them well, away or, Mike, yeah. Mike, I'm not sure if you caught this, but I mean, in a certain sense, I felt like he was far more critical in the book of Marxism and like the history of like, um, Mark, uh, communist revolution than of capital. He was much more vague about capitalism but he was very specific about the failures of Marxism. It didn't sound like he gave up on Marxism. I mean, it sounded like he gave up oh, on like no. Bolshevism, but like, um, sorry, maybe I misunderstood. Yeah, but it, 
Oh, no, no, no. I mean, I, I agree. Um, it's just that, you know, that it, it was just seems strange to me, um, or not strange, uh, like in a certain sense, like, because I feel like he is motivated um, via Marx, you know, uh, via, like he wants communism to seed, so he cares about why it, why it right. failed in the and past. He does, he does speak positively about workers' councils. Like, I, I got that theme a couple of times. It sounds like he, he believes that that is the path of revolution. Although he didn't really dedicate, like, a whole essay to how to, you know, implement the revolution. Um, Nathan, I'm kind of curious, like, at one point in the book, he talks about, like, the fall of, um, like, Russia's communism, like, Bolshevism, kind of falling into what he calls, like, Stalinism, which is, like, where the, uh -huh. the bourgeoisie has been sort of replaced by this bureaucratic class, and they wield the power. And then that becomes really appealing in, like, third world countries to adopt this, like, you know, sort of faux Marxism because it gives the local bureaucratic class a lot of power. So you, and I think that's kind of what he was getting at with, like, how China took off. Um, but do you feel like the USPS, like, is this sort of, like, bourgeoisie bureaucracy at all? Or, like, do you feel like that has... Oh, Mike, all bureaucracies are bourgeoisie bureaucracy. So how do you feel like that's... power is wielded in the USPS and how would that sort of be different than, than other, like, organizations? Well, let's just say in the U.S. or, I mean, in the certain, like, if you're looking at the exact, like, political economy, the United States Postal Service, I gotta be, I don't, I don't even know. I don't study the, I haven't really looked at, like, the larger, um, I just see, I mean, I guess I get a, a hint of, like, the ways in which you have, you know, you have bureaucratic policy and procedure, and then, like, how that gets, how that relates to people, like, real human beings. You know, there's there's always a gap there, and like how that gap gets filled in um, is very interesting. Uh, but I don't think I'm the only one here who's like involved in bureaucracy. I mean, in a certain sense, I'm guessing almost everyone here is involved in some form of bureaucracy or another. You know, because that's kind of how money gets distributed. You know, even within our uh, capitalist, or maybe especially within our capitalist. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think if like the reporting chain at my job is like enough of a bureaucracy to sort of match like the Stalinist. It, it kind of made it sound, I don't know, maybe, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I guess I sort of first read that as like the bureaucracy is wielded by the state. And so the USPS could be different than other other companies. But Yeah, but I, I think the American experiment is um, sort of like outsourcing all real government issues, right? Like your, your workplace, Michael, like deliver, you know, clothes people that could arguably be like a function of the government. My you know, I, I also work in the sort of like spinoff of, of government function, which is education, right? So we live in the convoluted bureaucracy of the United States, is like providing for its people, right? Like, it's just this country happens to have, you know, organizations that don't, I'm gonna don't work themselves as like part of the government, but they're, they're providing for people the ways that governments are supposed to that the government just doesn't take responsibility, because I don't know, we like, we like to sue so much that they've absolved themselves of all responsibility. I'm going to, I'm going to give a counterpoint to that because I feel like government can't provide clothes. And I say that from a psychological perspective where we just need more novelty than the, than the government can provide. Like we would become depressed we if need we more just, spectacle. yeah, we would get depressed if we wore like standard issue clothes. Like, I mean, I don't think it would keep up. Like I don't, it, it might, but um, you basically just need, uh, and this is probably sounds like me defending capitalism and I don't want to like make it sound like that. <laughs> no, this is your defending spectacle. <laughs> but I do think to be happy, we need a certain amount of novelty and maybe we're overstimulated and the amount of novelty that we need just keeps going up and up and that's good for consumption. But um, I don't want to dismiss what you're saying, but I do think it's what I hear is just a profound, like, um, what would you call it? Like a diminishing of the potential of government. Like who's to, who's to say government can't provide novelty? Why, why is that a given? I don't really hey, get that. Where you have, you I, got, Hmm. Other than yeah, the fact because because I, I think novelty doesn't come from a centralized body. I think it has to come organically. And so, like individual people would want to make clothes to express themselves, and then that would be, I guess, why. Yeah, I think that we maybe and not through capital, well, but should be able to source things organically rather than try to centralize production of novelty or authenticity. Mike, here's the thing. I think you're actually unintentionally hitting on uh, something like really close to the society, the spectacle here, and that's. Why is the novelty afforded by superficial things like clothes, like the real novelty? Like people, yeah. you, you know, you like you can dress in a million different clothes, but like are, are our subjectivities really that different anymore? I, you know, like, okay, wait, here's, really here's a hot verse and novel and on like a truly personal human level. 
I love that. I love okay. That that, leave it there. Yeah. I, I do like that. I do like that thought, and I hate that I'm about to say what I'm about to say right after it, because that is a really nice sentiment. Um, <laughs> I feel like somebody just, just dropped off. They want to hear. Um, that we like we need. I feel like we need more and more novelty to stave off this growing existential dread. That we need more novelty, not because we're consuming more and we need more stimulation, but because when we are bored, it's like Kierkegaard was saying, like we just can't deal with boredom. Um, yeah, Mike. Again, I think you you're totally you're perfectly summarizing the society of the spectacle. Yeah. This increasing, you know, it's the way that like again, it's 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 like a way that uh, capitalist demand for further profits has been internalized, and we now psychologically need more of this like inner like we need more and more and more just to, to not like want to die, you know, just to feel like we're alive. Oh fuck, did I get? This? No, 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 I, I can hear you. I'm listening. Oh, oh, never mind. Sorry, I thought I dropped again. It was so quiet. <laughs> well, I'm chewing on that. Um, and I think I, I just, I, you know, I can kind of see, I don't want to say I see both sides because I don't think there are two different sides here as much as there is just like a, you know, like a, a potential space where novelty can mean something that just is part of like a fruitful, happy life. It's not necessarily just like the novelty of the clothes we wear, but the novelty of our own um, I don't know, lived experiences or family units or whatever you want to call it, right? Like there's there's a lot of room for novelty there. I still, I'm still stuck on the fact that like, I don't think um, government is necessarily centralized. And I think, you know, I think that lots of times we're, we're sort of um, duped into thinking that the free market is not a sort of like um, governed body because what it, what it does is it sort of like, I don't know, creates this sort of like invisible, right? You've heard about the invisible hand of capitalism. It, it is this invisible hand that, um, decides what clothes ends up in the store and decides what food ends up on the shelf. It might as well be government. It's just, um, it's yeah, just, that, yeah. it's just where a literal government doesn't take responsibility for it. I would argue that they are wholly responsible and that they should take responsibility for it. And that there is room in taking responsibility for it to just provide a better life for us, right? Like if we acknowledge it and we study it and then we start to like tweak it so that like, instead of investing all this time into imaginary products, such as like whatever hot topic is selling, um <laughs> then then we can invest like our acknowledgement what this invisible hand is providing us into like just being happier right like instead of you know like instead of going down this like spiral of like neuroses in order to want to consume more we can just say hey like we've got this great tool that can provide people with novelty and we don't have to exploit them you know <laughs> like actually okay so I, I i feel like i don't i can't see it I can't see a government ever filling that role. I can't see really any sort of group of people that wields power holding a role being good for us. Like I, and I, I don't think that like a market really works clearly, but. Um, well, we have no free market. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, There's no such thing as a free market. Okay. So it's like we were saying earlier that like m using money to generate money has an effect that it is not like of the original intention. Like it's like a, it, it's a side effect. And so when we exchange, yeah, like instead of using our time to make money, when we use our money to make money, that is like what it introduces this like, this problem. I think likewise with social organizing, um, you can take a good idea and once you start adding people to it, then you're gonna get this like side effect that comes from interpersonal dynamics that's going to um, kill it. I, I will say I've heard recently um a figure that there's never been a leftist political like group in the past what 50 years or so or maybe like since world war ii that's grown uh more than 60,000 as soon as like like 60,000 is like the carrying capacity for leftism yeah what is that like over to currently window? exists yeah yeah i've heard different numbers okay. thrown around i mean it, it makes sense like you know the overton window which is like the most number of individuals that you can care about you don't think like 1500 what you're talking about yeah over to win like the yeah it's like 100 that, uh, 150 if what we what we talk about but sorry nathan I, I didn't mean to cut you off there no no you didn't cut me off but i was happy to <laughs> pass it off oh yeah mm. go for it where, where are we here like where are we are we are we we're talking are we are we on a debate about whether or not like a more collectivist approach to living is is possible for large groups is that where we are no, not that it's not possible, just that it it has to be done in a way that eliminates power dynamic. And I don't know that you can, yeah, I think once- yeah. I there's talk about power, for sure, like the way that that corrupts and 
in any of these situations. Yeah, I think it's just sort of there's this dehumanizing effect that, that happens when you start thinking it when you start using and then like that effect sort of creeps into other logic the way that like you know this sort of like replacing time with money kind of crept in and capitalism mm -hmm. i don't know i'm making a really vague i'm I basically i'm i'm trying to argue like an anarchist perspective but um we can, you know, we can, the, the uh the, the sort of bible for the for the anarchist movement right aren't it, the french anarchist movement? i don't know yeah i don't see it in there i do see the, the marxism but i don't see the anarchism well, didn't you hear, I mean, he had a, uh, a long critique of those anarchists that, you know, what is it? They wield power covertly such that it is even more powerful, you know, because it's not recognized as being power. Uh, yeah, that's a really good point. I read that as like an attack on libertarianism where he was like, he made, he, he said something nice about like collectivist anarchists, but then like <laughs> said those individualist anarchists um and i think he means like oh, well, and caps or like libertarians you know said they were laughable I, yeah well I, mike I'm it is board. i mean yeah, it's I'm a good board. point i, I hadn't I really considered that there is kind of a, an invisible power that you don't just walk away from because there's no people i think that i think that there's room here to talk about the difference between a spectacle and a sort of group think type of situation because i i really stand behind it i think maybe you can speak more to this michael because i think our human psychology just is dying for us to like belong to a group right it's all that it wants um it's to belong okay wait I, I found the perfect way i want to phrase this it's i think yeah. i think that we can have a society but i don't think that we can have a government there's something about going from society to government that like introduces this like corrupting force yeah i think marx would agree with you but i don't want to say the only approach then is like this like you know anarcho primitivist like i i i don't know i mean yeah this stuff like society and culture really interests me and like i as much as I like to like shit on the idea that the spectacle could just be a product of capitalism, like, I mean, it's clearly like pretty intuitive to us. And I think one way or another, we really do have to follow our gut. Like we, we, we can only fight it for so long. Um, I don't know. Well, like the, it's not that all spec, like he, he himself said, you know, it's not that all spectacles are capitalistic, but the way our current society is, is comes out of and, you know, is a certain individual sort of manifestation of capitalist forces. Yeah. So you're saying there can be a spectacle that exists outside of capitalism? Oh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there has. Like, I mean, you think of, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if it's, I mean, again, divorce so general with spectacle, you know, it's kind of blows my mind. Well, I think that's an important, I think it would be an important distinction to know, like, what he's saying there. Or it would be an important difference because um, I think kind of the, the crux of the movement here is that capitalism is responsible for the problems. And so if you're saying that the spectacle like is more of a phenomenon that can just attach to different power structures like the church or capitalism or like, I don't know, the monarchy or something like that, um, then really what we need to be looking at is where the spectacle comes from because it's not capitalism. It's something else. Well, Mike, let's go. I guess when I think of pre-capitalist spectacles, I think of like natural disaster. Like when I was trying to think of like, well, what would be a spectacle to sacrifice, right? Like sacrificial things. Yeah. Well, I mean, religious ceremonies, of course, but no, I mean, I was thinking like, like meteor, like something that, that like everyone see and everyone has a certain relationship to, um, from their, no matter where they are, like, um, like eclipses or, yeah. um, comets. You know, these things that were like regarded as like heaven, heavenly portents. I will you say know, though, like signs. I will say though that that might be ignoring an unconscious motivation to look at them as significant. Like if you look at the night sky. Or is, yeah, stars. I was just thinking that. Yeah. Like, hmm. Isn't that, yeah, the, the stars are almost like the, the primordial spectacle that we see the dramas of life that we like project our society into. Yeah, I guess. Oh. I don't I don't place the spectacle purely as an evolution of capitalism as much as it is just like pointed to as something that that we do that civilization does right um we 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 create spectacles right I, I mean maybe it's just a depending on where you draw the line between civilization and capitalism it might just be born from sort of like um yeah like like we're like we're talking about here the people getting together the societies right they 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 create spectacles for whatever reason. I don't think the natural disasters fall into that category. The retelling of those natural disasters may fall into that category. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I don't want to like, part of me feels like on some level it is psychological. That, and like, I think Nathan, like Marcuse was kind of talking about trying to take 
like a psych, like a therapeutic approach to our minds so that we can be a little bit more receptive of um, communism, that we can like, you know, change our way of thinking to be able to facilitate revolutionary action. Um, and like, that's good up to a point, but I think also that we just don't have a whole lot of control over our intuition and the way that we perceive things. Like, and I guess the point I was trying mm -hmm. to make about the spectacle being really old is that like, all right, if you look at like a very crowded picture, you like will look for something first. Like that's the first thing that you're going to notice. And that's for a reason. Like we look for, you know, symbols in things. We look for patterns and that's based on knowledge that we already hold. Um, and that really... are we going the Peterson route where essentially we have inbuilt structures that are like biological that essentially create the, that are like pre-formatted how I, we will proceed. I mean, maybe psychological, maybe sociological, like, let me, let me, let me try to put it into words. It's like, okay, there's, there's a meteor in the sky. Is it mm -hmm. that we look at the meteor in the sky because everybody else is looking at the meteor in the sky? Is it that we look at the meteor in the sky because like fire means something to us? Um, like it's a bad, it's a bad portent. Like it's, um, or do we, I, mean, I guess just look at it because it's the, like a shiny no, thing. Right. We're, we're just terrified. We are, we're scared. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't yeah, know. It's just, scared. I, I feel like it all maybe not comes down to psychology, but, and I guess that was the point I was trying to make about it. intuition is like, it can come down to psychology in a lot of ways, but you're still going to be bound by your intuition. Like, for example, like that whole, like that red house protest in really intuitively, <laughs> really intuitively seemed to me like a psychological issue, not like a class issue, but other people intuitively might read it as a, as a class issue and wouldn't really even think to look at William Nietzsche as like, you know, having a, a psychological problem. Um, Do, is sovereign citizens a mental disorder? I mean, that's kind of like the 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 original. Yeah, I mean, I think. And I, again, I want to step away from like the disease model, where like you know, there's <laughs> there's disorders. So it's unfixable, in other words. But I also don't. Yeah, I don't want to normalize that. Like that's that's a, that's not a good, that's <laughs> not a good way of thinking. <laughs> oh, you might be right. Yeah. Um, you know, sorry, sovereign citizens are a very funny bunch. Do you do you know any? No, no, I just saw the just through the internet, just as a spectacle. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I sort of had this like take where um, I don't know. I, I don't want to keep making the same point over and over, but like just what irony, <laughs> like how irony is killing us, and it's really really bad. Um, mm. And that I like appreciate it. Right, yeah. our our reaction to the red house protesters like the people that still support it is like ironic like we're laughing at them and that's like really dangerous for us to be doing <laughs> um what's wrong with laughing at them i think it's just that we use irony to to deal with capitalism or just to deal with alienation um and maybe if we took it away it, it could be that oh. accelerating force that would just force us to get rid of capitalism i don't know how you would remove irony though mike isn't it just good old schadenfreude um Irony is schadenfreude? No, no, no. The Red House thing. I don't... What's ironic about the Red House? Um, I think, like... And maybe you weren't here for this conversation, but, like, I think a lot of people are making fun of the protesters. Like, at least on Reddit, and that was sort of my first reaction. I think, like, you know, some of my other friends, but I, I guess it's, like, not... But, it, it, it's bad to have that wait, kind of reaction, but, I think. Mike, but why is mocking someone ironic? Um... I, I mean, I guess I just don't see the irony in there. Like stepping on someone it's because that you're, you don't like or you're feel like... Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's because it's you're like expecting I, them to act a certain way, but they're not. And so that that creates irony that you have to like joke about. Right, like people talk about it sarcastically. Like, oh, those fools. I don't know. Maybe maybe I, I, I read into that or I was projecting a little much. But um, yeah, I guess I, I feel like people sort of had an ironic detachment. Like it just sort of makes people laugh at the left at least within like even leftist circles. Um, and that is like both, it kind of has the effect of like fracturing the left, but also um, I think we're just, yeah, like I said, using kind of just irony to cope with like, you know, the the existential dread or like the um, alienation of capitalism. Um, so may I, I agree. I love that point. I wonder where you stand now on the Red House, having made that point about like irony being toxic. And do you like, so, so you say that statement and then do you say, so the red house protests are a valid protest or red house protests are an invalid? Yeah. I mean, I, I have thought about that a lot. Uh, there's an account right now that is like trying to spread the truth about the Kinneys. And like, I found him through this Instagram hashtag that was like the wrong one, but 
basically it's like another like leftist. He seems like a totally reasonable guy. I mean, if you look in the comments, he's like responding to people thoughtfully and it's not like mean or anything, but it's basically like just posting on Instagram, like court documents and like pointing out that he's a sovereign citizen. And it's trying to like, you know, get people to be aware of what the cause that they're donating to. Um, and like, I feel like, well, for sure. Oh, sorry. And so I, 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 the donations are a whole nother subject. I feel like, yeah. Um, and so it's like, it's hard for me to support the Kinney's. I mean, it really is. Um, and I, I don't think I can say that I do, but I don't think that it makes sense to try to block them like financially. I don't know. It's, it's, it's kind of a weird, I haven't quite found a good, good, good thought on the matter. If I can backpedal to like the, the point that I feel like I've landed on, um, which has nothing to do with the donations or the, the family themselves, but instead like this, this again, like using the, the tools of the, of the system against it, right? This is a spectacle, right? Who cares who the family is? I don't care. I think the donation thing is foolish. I'm not really going to think too hard about that. But what I do think is great is the media attention being given to the subject matter. And if I can get that, right, like, like you can read Society of the Spectacle and walk away feeling like you need to um, overturn the system that you live in, or you can walk away realizing that you now know, like, a new tool. You know a little bit more about the inner workings of this world you, we live in, and how can we mobilize that tool to, to serve our own interests a big part of that is just sort of like, who cares? Pick any old house that is getting an eviction and turn it into a spectacle that the media is going to report on. And now we can get this subject matter talked about at like an in, at, at an opportune time, right? Like it's a good time to talk about it. And sure, people are going to scrutinize the family, but, um, but I don't know. That it, it feels effective to me regardless. So it sounds like you're saying you could op- ideally use the spectacle to re- redistribute wealth, like not with not with like the, the baggage that that term carries, but like you could use it to sort of counteract the, um, you know, the more vicious forces of capitalism that that stratify people and make rich people richer. Well, poor, poor. You know, and for me, like the, the wealth thing is like, is hard for me to, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if I would say that you can distri- redistribute wealth, but what you can do at least do is like, and I hate to use like a tired term, but like wake people up a little bit, you know, and, and at least get, you know, this might be the access point for some 18 year old out there who now is going to change the world in 20 years, you know, like this, this very moment might be that access point and whatever that's, that's worth it to me. Yeah. But I also wonder, and I don't know if this is something that you can measure and this might just be like, you know, a, a, a wild goose chase. Would it have a reverse effect because the kidneys are so tr- problematic that people would read this and then say like people on the right or people that are on the fence would say, Oh, these like, you know, anarchists have really gone too far and kind of be turned off to, um, to the end goal. Yeah. And I can I, understand that. I think, I think I would say that next time I, I would hope that this, the lesson learned here is next time these, you know, whoever's picking this house should do their homework a little bit better. Right. Like I wouldn't personally have picked this house cause I don't know, you know what I mean? Like hopefully they do their homework next time. It's so stupid of them, whoever it is, whoever they are is, but um, yeah, it's still important to take, to take, you know, th- like PETA takes this standpoint big time, right? Like they will take any opportunity to make a big media splash and it's effective, right? And then never mind like what all the brands do, right? Like we were talking earlier about like the sort of donation uh, tactic, but they also, you know, they also do all these weird stunts or like even just Reddit as a whole use, use their sort of like a viral thing in order to, in order to, to perpetuate their product, right? Like it's an effective are we, way. Are we back to the ad busters thing? Like have they become this, the same kind of, um, kind of company? I, yeah. Well, I think they've just developed a model and they're sticking to it, even though it's time to evolve. Um, but, but Yeah. I mean, it's like you can't, I mean, I guess, yeah, you, you have to, like you, you actually have to, because you can't spread an anti-capitalist message through a capitalist society because it is so against how the market operates that your message just will not get out. Nobody wants to sell like an anti-consumer message. Um, right. And in a lot of ways, I think we're effectively, you know, when, when people talk about post-capitalist, I think we're effectively breaking capital right now. And it's going to, I think we're going to use these same, we're going to use money. We're going to use capital, right? We're going to use investments and we're going to use all these weird tools that exist right now in ways that we can't really like understand yet, but we're going to use them in profoundly non-capitalistic ways. It's already happening, right? Like with these, you know, the protest happens and then all of a sudden this person's bank account has 250,000 more dollars in it, right? Like it's, it's, it's breaking capitalism in a big way. It doesn't, it, it's not necessarily what we, the way we want it to happen. I just don't think we, I think we're going to be surprised by just how different it all, you know, the, the whole Pinker, you, you guys know about the Steven Pinker argument that life is better now than it's ever been before. Oh, uh, yeah. I've heard it. I think it's Steven Pinker. I really, yeah, that was a little Pinker, angels of our nature or 
better angels of our nature, right? I think I don't know if that was the title, but I would I would believe you if you're looking it up right now. Um, I'm not looking it up. That's pure out of memory. <laughs> Fuck, yeah. I haven't. I, 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 it was What's an eye opening. Sorry. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt Fran. That's the book. Yeah, it's like a 500 page book where he just like kind of lists all the reasons that things are better than it used to be like 500 years ago. And one of the things he talks about is broken windows policing in New York City, right? Which is something that we all want to hate. Um, Maybe that's a little. That's that's not quite on on subject. Oh, keep keep going on that point. Uh, I want to hear the end of that. I'm gonna drop that, and instead I'm gonna pick up (laughs) the the Walmart element of society today, right? Like the way that we all want to also hate, um, you know, these easily accessed commodities. But it turns out that like, and this is somewhat related to the broken windows policing, right? Is that we people are less inclined to steal today than they ever were before. Because it's so easy to just go, it's easier to go to Walmart and spend two bucks on whatever it is you want to buy. So you're not inclined to steal something anymore, right? So well, it's easier to steal from Walmart. Yeah, that's true. It's also easy to steal from Walmart, but but it also the, just the way the fact that things are so cheap now for you know people in the United States is part of is, is an unexpected way that capitalism actually ended up serving non-capitalist causes, right? Like we don't it, like. It's, it's working in this weird way to have made things so cheap that people don't want to steal anymore. Now we've, now we've hit this post-capitalist state where it's like, things are so cheap that I'm now deliberately not buying something that I need because it's like, I have this mentality of like, I can make do without, you know, like what a weird place to have landed in 2020 is to say like, I can make do without, you know, a new pair of socks, even though this pair of socks has a hole in it, right? Like pa- capitalism wasn't supposed to produce that, but it did. And, um, I don't know. Fran, I'm, Fran, I'm really, I'm really confused. You're saying it's so cheap now that you don't want to buy anything. It's in, in no, in a weird way. It's I'm no longer desperate. So, but so yeah. I mean, sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm just confused by what I'm hearing. I, would I think, think I think Fran's basically so saying cheap. that capitalism has like has had these unintended side effects that oh definitely can, can be seen as positive. Um, okay, yeah. I just wasn't like, seeing the positive in that. Yeah. And I, I don't want to like bristle away from that. Like, um, but I also think that we're not going to decide whether capitalism is like good or bad based on like, I don't know, maybe like any one outcome. It's hard. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I feel like a lot of people put value on the ability of capitalism to like um, effectively like decide prices and stuff like that. Or I don't know. I don't know if that's. I think what I think is I, I'm just trying to circle back to the, the protest in there in Portland and how those are, you know, sort of like capitalistic in their in their like at their core but how, you know, because it's about evictions or whatever. It's about, like, the way that money was poorly dis- distributed. Um, I don't know. I, I'll stop ranting. I want to, I'm, I'm curious where you all, where you all went with your thoughts. I got, I got too focused on Walmart. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me see. Let's talk about, let's talk about Walmart. I don't know. There's, there's, there's plenty of stuff to talk about there. I feel like at one point he talks about, like, ideology as, like, social capital. And that might be kind of, like, a good way of looking at um, how the dominant ideology kind of perpetuates that like we become popular by selling the spectacle um and so it's sort of like this motivation for it to you know keep itself alive i don't know part of me part of me feels like looking at this with it like taking for granted that there is a spectacle and then part of me wants to like be like okay this is like a model of how to look at society and it's not necessarily like how it actually works but it it can be useful um and like then it becomes about trying to find like the right model for the right situation um and I guess like the point I was trying to make about like the Red House thing is that like we don't really get to choose what model we want to use. Like there is just kind of like a way of intuitively looking at these things and like we can't really fight our intuition, but we don't really get to choose our intuition because it's like the product of what we have been exposed to passively. So there's not really like a moral value in having a good intuition. And I, I don't even, I guess you can kind of change your intuition by like intentionally like shaping your education. But um, I, I guess I'm, I, I, I don't have a whole lot of faith that like one could like have a moral read on the situation, like a more moral perspective than another. I don't know. Do you guys think that there's a moral way of looking at the Red House or is it just perspective? I mean, I mean I... props to the players, you know, that was a nice hustle. <laughs> so like under like a uh, Machiavellian or like um, Aristotelian kind of point of view, like they, they had excellence in their aim and that was the good. Oh, I mean, they, they made off like bandits, you know, that's all I know. I think they bought their house back. I, it's a little hard for me to tell what's going on right now. It sounds like they, the family worked to deal out with the city, and I think it's to buy the oh, house back. From, I could be wrong. From what I heard, essentially the, the person who bought it at auction offered it to them for his cost. Oh, okay. Yeah, it would be a little awkward to be the person that lives in the red house after all that. Yeah. 
I think, I think he was a motivated seller. Out. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of interesting though. Is like, are we using like ostracism for like social progress? Like, is that actually maybe like a valid thing to do that? Like, um, if you do, if you are confident in your aims, like you really do believe that they are good, then presumably you can justify a lot more than you would normally to be able to accomplish them. And is that then bad? Did that make sense? I, think, I might not have phrased that right. I think I'm, I'm, I'm getting what you're saying. I, I'm stuck. I'm so stuck on good and bad because it was something that I held my tongue on is just like, I just, I think this is a core disagreement. I just don't. Yeah. I think we talked about this before. It's like, I just really have tried to place morality outside of my like scope. I don't, I don't deal in good and bad, right? Like it's, it just, it is what it is. Is my. It just deals in you. <laughs> right. It's, did these people do something bad? No, they just did what happened, right? But, sorry, that's, I don't, I, I recognize that that's not useful, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Nietzsche would probably like that perspective, but. Yeah. Um, Can I get some clarification on that, Fred? Are you saying you don't judge the people as good or bad, or you don't judge the action? As I think both action and people. You know, I, I, mean, I guess like you I, have to be able to like to make some kind of value on like something that happened. Like I don't know, it's, it's, it would be hard to to move. Let's bring it back to the spectacle. I think what what frustrates me, and I wouldn't place this necessarily in the bad category, but what frustrates me is when people are living a falsehood. So. I don't see things in terms of good or bad. I just see them in terms of real or not real. Like, are you are you living in in the here and now, or are you living in like your la la, you know, land? Whether that's a power trip or some other disassociative space that you inhabit, right? Just to explore that, like, if somebody robbed a bank, there you you're saying they would would be living in like a fantasy where like they need they need money to exist. Someone robbed a if someone robbed a bank, a theoretical bank. I would say, hey, they probably were in, the, you know, their circumstances were probably pretty dire if they if they committed such a crime. If someone robbed a bank that that lived that that I like uh, had money in, if someone robbed me, for example, I would be pretty upset personally. I don't know where can where can Wouldn't, I separate this? I think about? it would actually be good if they robbed a bank because then it's like an attack on on capitalism. Maybe like a better right. example would be like they harmed another person or like something right. that is that is more unequivocally wrong. I guess like, and I don't mean to to totally like derail the conversation, but like. What I feel like is we sort of just have these beliefs that we take for granted and then, you know, we maybe aren't totally, the way that like we understand our own thought process is not necessarily the same as the thought process itself. And so like, it's, there's a lot of value in trying to get in touch with like, um, why we think the way, um, well, so if I, if I may like respond to the, if, if someone harmed another person, I think that, um, a good summarizing, a good way to summarize that action would be it's bad, but I think a more real way to to summarize to, to describe what happens there is, is like why would why would a person harm another person there's obviously some sort of like disassociative thing here like humans biologically want to connect with each other not harm each other so there's some something repairable there in terms of like that person's choice to make that action and it's and it's like so yeah like it's bad it's bad that they did it because but the, the source of the badness isn't the person or the action it's in the dis disassociation from their own like biological needs, right? Like they, they, they should not hurt people because of the way that our biology was designed, right? Should biology dictate morality then? Like if, if- I guess I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, a, I'm kind of a purist when it comes to like the sciences, right? Like I, I do think that's all we've got is biology. All we've got is biology. I don't really see what else we've got. But there are some gross things that come with our, maybe, I don't know if this has biological ties, but our, at least our psychology that seems to be innate that we can kind of program out of ourselves that seem to be that like it seems like racism and tribalism are part of our biology almost and i don't know i don't see that as necessarily a good thing like an appeal to nature because they're because they're part of our biology that we shouldn't try to overcome them i don't know i, I think i maybe i'm too much of an optimist i don't think that those things are are innate you know i, I think we're such we're, we're squishy humans are the squishiest of the of the animals on the planet so we can turn into anything depending on the context in which we're raised almost anything Steven Pinker, who, who you brought up before, I think would disagree, um, but not, not saying that I necessarily agree with him. Um, I, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm that optimistic. I, I feel like there are things, I think, I think science is generally, like, obviously, like, amoral, and there are unfortunate things that we can learn about ourselves that we can try to change, but that are, like, a part of who we are. Yeah, I mean, I guess, and yeah, I, I feel like what both, there's a lot of truth in what both of you are saying, that, like, potentially, like, morals have this artificiality to them, but also, you know, yeah, I don't know. I think that that kind of highlights the the struggle that a lot of people feel with like the Red House, where it's like um, a lot of people on the left are still saying like, well, good is coming out of it, therefore it is good. And then um, 
a lot of people just don't really see it as a thing. Like they, they think that it's kind of just like this artificial, you know, event or construct. Um, but I feel, again, I don't know. I feel like I'm going to die in like Freud's bedroom, but, um, yeah, I guess it just matches up more with like my, my experience probably because of my, because of college studying it, but, um, that ultimately we're just driven by unconscious. I mean, I'm sure we're conscious of a lot of them, but by drives and at least there's value in trying to understand our motivation why we have a certain perspective and then how that plays out in shaping our moral reasoning. Because I think, yeah, like we can try to reprogram. I don't know. Maybe we can, maybe we can't. Um, but I do think a shift in thinking is necessary. Like I, I don't want to sound too like doom and gloom, but like, I think Edeboard hits the nail on the head. And, um, if, if we don't do something like we're kind of, we're, I don't know. It's just, it, it feels off. Like it does feel, and you can't. Yeah. And he paints a picture where, you know, you don't want to escape it through just consent. So I think we should try oh. to try and try to find a non-monetary way to deal with it. Mike, have you ever, or have you guys seen, um, uh, fuck, Arnold's, um, fuck, the, the, the rebel on Mars, um, total recall. Yeah. The Arnold Schwarzenegger maybe? Yeah. Oh, but it's also a Philip K. Dick story, right? About being able to, uh, forget certain memories. No, 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 or, no. Or sorry, recall, um, recall memories that have been erased. No, no. Total recall was essentially, um, it's like the next level of virtual reality. You know, it's, oh, it's right. you, and then, yeah. you, you, uh, you're like a revolutionary hero, you know, like in a certain sense, the oh. spectacle, the, the insidious thing about the spectacle is that it so easily captures rebellion. Like rebellion mm-hmm. itself is now part of it. But does it though? I mean, there must be something that hasn't been captured for us to latch onto this book. Like there capitalism can't have complete domination over us because there's still some part of it, some part of us that's able to notice it and like is, you know, disturbed by it enough to try to challenge it. Are we though? I mean, are we really challenging it? I don't know. Like, and that's where I'd I'm say not the... challenging it. I'm, yeah. sitting, I'm sitting in the comfortable, <laughs> it's not a, maybe not, not right. a $900 couch, but you know, like I'm, I'm sitting on some comfortable commodity here. Right. And then you know, know, yeah. looking at another commodity, <laughs> listening to a commodity. And then you're experiencing you know, like, guilt. Like Sorry, we're not, we're not that? organizing rebellion here. Fran, were you going to say something? I was going to say something stupid. But I do think... Oh, <laughs> I was going to say that I moved from the, from the couch to a chair that we found on the side of the road. So I hope that's that. <laughs> 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 oh, it's a... Uh, oh. Sure, Fred, you're not supposed to feel guilty about it. You're supposed to enjoy it. <laughs> that was your labor time that went into buying that commodity. Right, right. Oh, I think, oh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I think there's something, though, about, um, I don't know. Okay. Like, <laughs> Sorry, Fred, I really was not poking fun at you. I, thought, I just thought it was a, a great, uh, I guess, irony, or, you know, I just thought it was yeah. very nice. What? That, uh, you you actually outed how much your couch costs on the, this potentially public forum. Mm-hmm. Why why do you guys think we want to read this book? Like what what value is there? What like becoming aware of this pro- of this is like you know painful for us. So like why do we put ourselves through it? Uh, oh, it's like Hellraiser, you know. Like uh, the world, you know, the current spectacles are so banal. You know, we need uh, you know whether it pleasure or pain, we need that limit experience. We wanna we wanna go past our limits. And then you buy you know, a vacation. Me. Then you buy a vacation package to then like reset how much stimulation you need. Oh yeah, so it's like the it's like um, virtual reality trilobites, you know. I mean, I I find great, you know, like I am in, in constant search of things that feel more true. So I I read this and I I covet this book and I read it because it you know it feels true. It feels true to my my lived experience. I, I walk around living what feels like a constant like a barrage of people who are disassociated and then occasional uh, frequent moments where I'm, I myself am disassociated. And then you read this book and it's like a moment of clicking of like, Oh yeah, like everything's kind of fucked up. So yeah, like there's some, there's some flaws in the, in the society that's trying to keep us in line with not questioning it, but there's enough of us who seek this out and, and, you know, like we're, we're stuck in our, in our homes, living our capitalist lives. But but I do think we all, all secretly wish for the rebellion. It's just like hard to organize. I think. Um, Wait, let me, as a thought experiment, though, let's pretend that we were having this conversation under monarchy and that we didn't live in a capital, I mean, I, I don't know, like an authority, I, maybe a, a totally different system of government. An overtly authoritarian. Sure. But like, would we have then latched on to that kind of structure and then be criticizing it in like this very grandiose? Like, is it? Well, again, I come back to the fact that I don't, I don't tie 
spectacle directly to this form of society or this this capitalism even i know that that it might be in this book but it is something that's very possible and under monarchy um i think i think yeah we we would we we might we might be inclined to read this we might also be inclined to read some like something about democracies and how much we love them is that what you mean is that we you know like we might latch on to things that that are antithetical to the society that we live in is that the the thing that you're saying i guess the yeah the point i was trying to make is that like if we've bought into the spectacle why do we want to challenge it like why why put ourselves to but i mean i'm profoundly opposed to the spectacle and i would i'll I'll seize any opportunity i can get to, to fight it but wouldn't you i guess and again i'm not saying we should accept it but as would we not technically just feel better if we could accept it okay maybe that's a little weird i, I don't know that we can adjust how we feel about things well mike i think but, uh, you know i think mike, i think this has made people really unhappy and whether or not they are dissecting it in the same way that we are yeah happiness is different you know is might be our differences Right, so the spectacle makes you unhappy regardless of whether or not it's your analyze. It just yeah. makes people unhappy. Okay. And I don't know if we're trying to wrap up here, but yeah. I, I feel like we we have to um, bring up the context, you know, the, the artistic context, because that's the angle that I read this through, right, is that I read it in art school. And you talk when you talk about um, this type of work, you have to talk about the Dadaists, right? The, the, uh, the urinal that, that is signed, that was, that was part of the Society of the Spectacle messaging. Mm-hmm. Uh, you all, what's that what's that guy's name uh didn't it start with an m duchamp yeah marcel duchamp uh duchamp yeah he he yeah like that's that is the that's the art that that sort of comes adjacent to this book as well as i don't know if you all have seen like the other sort of like cult, weird collage stuff that the dadas made which was just about like being disorienting and not really clear and it's uh and what it's getting at you know, the urinal was just like a big slap in the face to capitalism. But the, the other Dada stuff was more just like, here's some chaotic, you know, collages. What do you, you're not, you, you can't make anything of this. You know, this is, this is just this. Have you all watched, have you, have you watched the, the video that Guy Debord put out on, if you can get it on YouTube. It's this video that's like two hours long. It's just like all these pictures. He just, he just compiles all these different, almost like Adult Swim, right? Like he compiles all these uh, short clips from TV of the era yeah, and it's just like boobs and lots of explosions, and it's that's like the video that cul- is this video. Is it the same as culture jamming, or is that a later thing? I I, I can imagine that it's um that it's related. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and that's kind of like trying to shake shake capitalism. I mean, I and I guess if it's through art, that's good because it's not doing you know damage the way that like this neo reactionary accelerationist kind of anti egalitarian philosophy would have. Um, right. Yeah, I was looking at, I think it's, I don't know how it's pronounced, Juan Miro? Juan Miro? Uh, Moreau. Moreau, yeah. I, yeah, but um, I'll post it in the Discord. There's a, a pretty cool piece of art called May May 68, which was meant to commemorate the um, May of 1968 uprising um, protest. Let's see it. Yeah, I'll, I'll post it after this. Okay. Um, this might be a good good point to wrap up. I don't know. Did anybody have any other thoughts that they wanted to add? What? If I'm still, st- I, I still want to elaborate a little bit on this Dada oh, yeah. thing. Don't don't let, don't let me keep you too long, but um, I I think it's important to remember again where, right where we started, right the context of when this was written, and especially in relation, I think the accelerationists are such a great like uh, opposite end of the spectrum of where this is because right after you know this was written right after World War II when French when France was recovering from like the worst thing that's ever happened to that country and accelerationists have evidently lost that memory right like they have forgotten how bad things can be and the situationists where dadaists and Guy Debord came from they were like reeling from the pain of world war ii and their take was like holy shit like we nothing makes sense right like human nature is so chaotic and flawed like who you know like it came from this place of like of like having seen chaos and now trying to like define what what is going on um, and there's a lot of you know so a lot of it is depictions of chaos and a lot of it is um would you say that dadaism was the first art movement that was meant to be ironic a good question because it kind of seems like the way they're processing this trauma of world war ii is irony. just to have yeah. yeah and again i mean i i don't mean to paint irony as bad i i think that you're, you're raising a really point yeah, yeah. well yeah I, I think i think that's a, a good question Nathan or Eddie, did either of you guys have any any thoughts? I think I'm officially tapped out. I've said everything I have to say about <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, maybe end. Uh, all I really have to say is that 
I feel like um, in a certain sense, you know, we when we think of like how how much different is like Dada art from like modern advertising? Like the ability for advertising to. I remember this when I when I was like had my first uh, trip on acid. I was just like, oh yeah, it's like advertising. You know, it's like uh, it's like that ad. Like I remember there was like stuff. I was looking at the trees and I was thinking like, oh yeah, I've, I've like seen this before. It was in a uh, like insurance advertisement. You know, like even that. You know that that sort of imagery. You know, it's all incorporated. You know, there's no as soon as you find an outside, it becomes inside. You know, it's brought inside. It's incorporated. I think outside and, and um, inside is a really interesting metaphor to use for like philosophy. I don't know if that's already a term, but I like it. <laughs> outside, <laughs> I think I think those are terms. Yes, <laughs> I mean I'm not sure philosophical or yeah. whatnot, but anyways, you guys are tapped, right? Yeah, let's call it. I'll I'll hit the stop button.